Good afternoon. How are you guys uh, doing right now? Are you holding up? I trust that the Lord is with you and that the Lord has been preserving you all throughout uh, these times. Um, of course, there's something that I'd like us to start praying for right now. Uh, there's just been confirmation that there are 23 uh, new cases, uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our uh, city. And so uh, this brings the total to, I think, uh, more than 50 people right now. So it's beginning to spike up right now. And so we really need to come before the Lord in, in prayer. So let's intensify our prayers. Uh, several people in uh, Zapatera, I think uh, it's in Barrio Luz, uh, are actually infected. And so uh, that's, that's the hot spot as of this time. So before we start, I'd like uh, us to begin in a word of prayer. So can you bow your heads together with me right now as we come before the Lord in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you once again. Lord, we trust in your sovereignty. We trust in your power. We trust in your goodness and love. And we thank you, dear Lord, that you have been preserving your uh, children. We thank you, dear Lord, that things are still basically under control in our city. And we thank you, Lord, that right now we're able to discover those who are infected so that they might be treated properly. And so we continue to pray for our health workers, oh God. We continue to pray that you might protect them and preserve them. Uh, most especially those who are members of this church, Lord, we pray that your protection might be upon them. Uh, we thank you also, Lord, for your grace upon our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the provisions that you have granted to your children. We thank you, O oh God, that you're moving mightily and powerfully by bringing souls into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we continue to trust you, Lord, that you will bring about a harvest of souls. We give you thanks and praise for this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. So today, uh, what I'd really like to talk to you about is I'd like to talk about the life of Abraham. I think there are a lot of things that we can learn from his particular life story and of course, one of the things that we know in regard to Abraham is that he went through uncharted territory. And basically, this is how it appears uh, in our city as well as in our country, but not only in our country, even the rest of the world. As we very well know, uh, this has practically taken us by surprise. Nobody actually saw this coming. Uh, the government did not see this coming. The churches did not see this coming. The businessmen did not see this coming. This is totally uncharted territory. And so the basic question I believe that we are asking right now is how do we navigate through these uncharted waters, so to speak? And I'm trusting that, once again, as we go to the scriptures, we might find some answers. And I believe that that's what the Bible is able to do. The Bible always has answers for life and living. And that's one of the things that we thank God for. That is why this is really the time wherein you and I need to study the Word of God, not only study the Word of God, but meditate on it so that we can glean uh, principles. We can have spiritual anchors so that our lives would have great stability and great security. So if you have not been touching your Bible enough, I would like to recommend once again that you do that because I think it's very important that we do so. The Lord Jesus Christ said that the words that He speaks to us are spirit and they are life. And so the Bible gives us answers to life and living. Anyway, I'd like to go to the story of Abraham at this time, and I'd like to begin our discussion with uh, Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. And so, allow me to invite you, if you have your Bibles together with you, to kindly open to Genesis chapter 12, beginning 
at verse 1. And so kindly do that, please. So allow me to read uh, beginning at verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your own country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed uh, from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, the Bible says, uh, we'll stop there for a while. In, this is found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 5. Now, where did Abraham come from? Uh, we are told in the scriptures that he came from Ur of the Chaldeans. And if you're trying to find out where this is in modern day times, this is probably part of modern day Iran. It so happened that the land of Ur at that particular time was uh, quite a bustling metropolis. Uh, it was doing very well, economically speaking. And so you'd probably think that this was not a good time for Abraham once again to start all over again. Most especially because he was around 75 years old or around 70 years old at that time. So this was really not a good time to start off a new life, a new chapter in your life. And basically, uh, in the place where Abraham was, we could imagine that he was pretty settled there. He was already married. Uh, his relatives were there. His friends were there. His business was probably there. His livelihood was there. And so why, why change courses at the age of 75 years old? But there's one thing we have to understand. This is all about the will of God. And this is something that Abraham particularly understood. He understood that for a believer, it is very important that you walk at the center of God's will. Now, whether we like it or not, there is a pandemic that is taking place. And I have discussed to you the fact that God is sovereign. God is seated on the throne. We studied about the life of Job. And we said that there is nothing that happens here on earth that is without the permission of God. So when things begin to happen here on earth, it is either they are ordained by God or they are permitted by God. So once again, that speaks about the authority of God, that speaks about the rulership of God. And of course, uh, a lot of you are asking, why does God allow something like a pandemic to take place? And I gave you a few answers in the past few Sundays that we've been together, the past few Wednesdays that we've been together. God is achieving His purposes. And one of the things that we know and understand is that this is going to bring glory to God. Now, I know it's very difficult to think about how God can glorify Himself in this situation, most especially if you have questions in your minds, if you have doubts in your minds. I'm sure that a lot of you are thinking, well, how does God glorify Himself in this situation? But you need to understand that the Scriptures even speak about the wrath of God bringing glory to Himself. So anything and everything that happens can be brought to bring glory to the name of God. I shared to you about the life of Lazarus as well. Uh, last Sunday, remember that Mary and Martha sent uh, a message uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ when he was in the Judean wilderness that his friend Lazarus was sick. And we are told that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ tarried for two more days. And as he tarried for two more days, finally he went to Bethany. And by the time he reached Bethany, Lazarus was already 
four days in the burial place. He was four days dead already. And yet, God, through Jesus Christ, was able to raise up Lazarus from the dead. And obviously, that brought great glory and honor to God. So once again, I know that we're looking at a very dark situation in our country, most especially right now in our city with the 23 confirmed new cases here in Cebu City. Obviously, this looks bleaker and darker for us. And obviously, this means that uh, the community quarantine would probably be extended. How long it will be extended, we don't know. Probably uh, middle of May, probably even uh, beyond May even. We don't really know. But the important thing is to uh, keep ourselves in the Lord, keep ourselves uh, attuned to what God is trying to do, and really ask God at this particular time, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? May I submit to you, dear brothers and sisters, that probably one of the things that God wants us to do is to intensify our prayers. And I think one of the end goals of our prayer should be the harvest of souls. Already I've been hearing some feedback that there are some people who are coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In fact, we had one uh, person writing to our inbox, our Facebook page, and basically stating that for the first time, she understood what the gospel was all about. And so we're very thankful to God for that. Remember what the Bible says, even with one sinner that repents, the whole of heaven rejoices. And I'm sure that it's not just one soul that's going to be saved in this pandemic crisis. I'm sure there are more. So once again, the important thing is to be aligned with God's will, continue to pray, continue to share the gospel to as many people as possible. So anyway, going back to the story of Abraham, he went through uncharted territory. Now think about this. God told him, I'm going to give you a land, but God did not give him a map. <laughs> That's the interesting part here. I mean, if, if somebody is going to tell us that we're going to transfer location or transfer to another residence, obviously, we would like to know where we're going to go. You don't go into a car or you don't ride a car not knowing exactly where the driver is going to bring you. Obviously, when you get into a car, you'd like to be able to know where you are going. But you see, our walk with God is really a walk of faith many, many times. God does not reveal the future to us. And perhaps one of the reasons why God doesn't reveal all of the future to us is because He understands that we could be intimidated. He understands that we could actually be afraid of the future. Most especially if we understand that we are going to go through certain hurdles, certain obstacles, certain impediments, certain trials in our lives. If God just reveals all of that to us, we'd probably be intimidated and we'd probably say, Lord, I don't want to go. Or maybe some of us would say, I quit. And that's the reason why sometimes God doesn't give us the whole picture of what tomorrow is all about because that could scare us and intimidate us. Having said that, it's really very important to really uh, take our strides. After all, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And I would like to add, uh, just like what George Mueller said, not only does God ordain our steps, but He also orders our stops as well. So it's not just the steps, but even the stops. If you recall also, when Israel came out of Egypt, they were led by this cloud of glory and the pillar of fire by night. Every time the cloud of glory moved, that was a signal that they were to move. When the cloud of glory stopped, that was a sign for them to stop. And so right now, we don't know exactly where God is taking us, right? Uh, insofar as the businessmen are concerned, where does that take us right now? Most especially 
considering the fact that we are now on an impending uh, global recession. So the question is, Lord, where are you taking me? And I think for the politicians, the government officials, they're probably wondering, Lord, where are you taking us? And most especially for us uh, believers, for us, for us church members, we're beginning to ask the question, Lord, where are you taking the church? So the situation that you and I are, are faced in right now is practically the same as that of Abraham. We're trying to navigate through uncharted territory. But one thing is very important. You know, when you're driving a car, um, it's always easy to move the, the steering wheel when the car is moving. Now, you will notice that when the car uh, has stopped at a particular place and you try to move the steering wheel, it, it's very difficult to move it. So it's a lot easier to actually move the steering wheel when it is moving. So what do we need to do during these times? Well, we just have to move forward. That's, that's the wisest thing for all of us to do. We can't, we can't stop right now and let the whole world stop for us. I mean, that's something you and I cannot do. And that's the reason why we're doing this live streaming. We're moving forward. We don't know exactly where God is taking us, but is taking us somewhere. And by the way, we do have spiritual anchors by which you and I can find security and stability in our lives. And so we trust the Lord. We are not leaning on our own understanding, but putting our full weight of trust in the Lord. And you know, the Christian life is all about faith. And let me just remind you that every act of disobedience is always because of a lack of faith. If there is something that must not happen to us right now, it is lacking in faith. That's something that obviously should not at all happen in our lives. We need to continue in faith. We need to continue trusting the Lord because, again, He's bringing us somewhere. We don't know where He is bringing us, but I'm sure wherever God is bringing us, it will accomplish His purposes. And after all, this is what is important. Oftentimes, we, we think of very man-centered goals. We, we think about our aspirations. We think about our dreams. We think about our families, the security of our families. Now, while that is all legitimate, and I am not at all stating that we should not be thinking about those things, sometimes the problem with us is that we have placed God on the periphery of our lives. We're no longer concerned about the kingdom. And if you go to the Lord's Prayer once again, or what some people would call the disciples' prayer, the priorities of God are very clear. It's crystal clear for all of us to see. It's very plain. Again, just repeating to you the Lord's Prayer, it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the beginning point. That's the priority. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, the problem sometimes with the church nowadays is that it has become very, very pragmatic. And our focus is no longer that which is heavenly. Our focus is that which has become very, very earthly. Again, the Bible is very clear. Uh, in the book of Colossians, we are told that we are not to focus on things below, but to focus or fix our eyes on things above. Jesus Christ himself said to us, Lay not treasures here on earth, which moth and rust will destroy, wherein thieves break in and steal, but lay your treasures in heaven, the Bible says. And so, friends, this is all about the purposes of God. So again, if, if our minds and our hearts are attuned to what God is trying to accomplish, our hearts will be at rest. We will be saying to God, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Wherever it is, wherever it is that you are taking us, Lord, take us there, because this is for your glory and this is for your honor. And I think if we have that mindset, we will lose this this fear in our hearts, 
we will lose that, that anxiety and that worry that we have. Because after all, we are assured that God will take care of us. I mean, this is something that is promised to us by the Lord. And so let's not worry about that. Now, obviously, maybe there are certain things that we have to deaccumulate. Maybe this is the time to take away all those luxuries, those excesses that we have in our lives. And so right now, we're, we're, we're down to bare minimum, the bare minimum, the bare necessities of life. Well, if we have food, if we have shelter, we have clothing, the Bible says we have enough. And of course, God is enough. But anyway, going back to the story of Abraham, try to imagine he brings with him a whole caravan. He brings with him his father, his wife, uh, his nephew was there, uh, his uncle was there. Everybody was, was moving away from the land that they were settled from, the land which uh, they were very familiar with the culture, with the language. Uh, they were familiar with the customs. They were familiar with the business dealings, the trading, the transaction. And now they were moving out. It was really uncharted territory. And the question is, how do you navigate through uncharted territory? Now, this is a tribute, by the way, to Abraham. And I like to quote to you uh, what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 says. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Now, I'd like you to see the connection. It was because Abraham had faith that he obeyed the Lord. And if you're going to be an obedient child of God, it's because you have faith in the Lord. It's because you trust Him. So let me just pause at this time and let's take stock of our spiritual lives once again, as we're, we're prone to do these past few days. Here, here's my question for you. How's your faith meter before the Lord? How's your trust level with your God? Because depending on the faith that you have, that is how you would obey the Lord. That's why faith is such an important element in our lives and you need to understand how did our christian lives begin it began with faith it began by trusting in the lord jesus christ and let me remind you what we trusted we trusted in a man more than two thousand years ago who shed his blood who died a criminal's death remember crucifixion was not a glorious way to die it was a criminal's death now think about the faith that it took for you to believe in a man that you never saw, a man who was so far placed in history more than 2,000 years ago, died a criminal's death and you put your faith in him that he would cleanse you and wash you and save your soul. I mean, that's a lot of faith, I would say. But you see, we had faith to believe in him. And because of that, our soul was saved. Our names have been written in the book of life. Our, our sins have been cleansed. Now, if you and I were able to take that giant, humongous leap of faith, I mean, think about what kind of faith is required for the pandemic. I don't think it's as big and as a, a, a giant kind of a leap of faith compared to the leap of faith that we had when we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me encourage you. Let's put our trust in the Lord at this time, even though this is uncharted territory, even though we're trying to navigate, we're, we're moving the vehicle, so to speak, we're steering the wheel, but we don't know exactly where this is going to be headed. We don't even know what the timeline of God is concerned. A lot of people have been asking, um, are these uh, signs that we are immediately 
uh, moving towards the rapture or the tribulation period? Well, one thing's for sure. Every forward movement of history is leading towards the rapture, the tribulation period, and the second coming. So definitely, we're, we're moving towards that uh, timeline, but we don't know. So it's hard to presume, and we can't make predictions, and I, I do not believe that we should be doing that, because people have always been making uh, predictions. When the bubonic plague took place in Wittenberg, they were saying, now it's, it's the time, it's the tribulation period is about to take place. And I recall sometime in the 1990s, some people were actually even putting a date as to the rapture. Now we can't do that. We don't know where God is taking us, but we know the God who is holding our hands. Amen? We're just like this child that's crossing the street. We don't know exactly where we're going, but God is holding our hands. And we know that the God that we serve is a good God. And wherever He takes us, it's going to be well with us in the end. Even if the road that, that He is leading us into is the road leading to death. Now, I'm talking about death right now because we need to talk about it from a Christian perspective. I mean, if it happens that some of us die during this particular time period, is it something that we should really be scared about? I don't think so. Remember, the book of Hebrews says that one of the things that was removed from us is the fear of death. And why should we fear death? The Greek word used for death is the Greek word exodou, and the English translation of that literally would be an exodus. And so think about death this way. It is an exodus from this ugly, stained, pandemic-filled life into a life which is perfect, no pandemic, no disaster, no calamity, everything's perfect. And you live with a perfect bad. Now, I mean, how, how bad could that be? That's not bad at all. That's the best life ever. And this is exactly the reason why Jesus died on the cross. Because this is not our final destination. See, I think that's our problem many times. Even Abraham, we're told in the scriptures that he was looking for a city and, and a, a builder. He was looking for that city which did not have earthly foundations. And I think that's the kind of attitude we're supposed to have. I mean, life here on earth is fleeting. And we have got to prepare ourselves for eternity. Having said that, I'm not saying that, that God will take us home at this time. Maybe He would do that with some. Maybe He will not do that with others. But if God chooses that we remain alive at this time, it's not so that you could sit down and be lazy. Understand that. Don't be spiritual lazy at this time. Take God. I mean... Take whatever it is that God is bringing you towards and embrace that calling. Embrace the will of God in your life. And so, again, uh, reading verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And here's the interesting part. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He went out not knowing where he was going. I mean, that is amazing. That is awesome faith, I would say. And that's the kind of faith I hope that you and I have right now in this uncharted territory. I know some people in Living Word are kind of tired of me sharing this this testimony, because you've heard me share this quite a number of times. I even shared it in my book. But, you know, I, I believe that there are some who are listening right now. Maybe it's the first time you're going to hear uh, me speak, or maybe this is the first time you're going to hear my testimony. Well, Cebu is my home. I mean, this is where I want to die. But I was not born here. 
My wife Marie was not also born here. Uh, we were born and raised in Manila. And all our lives, uh, when we were still there, we thought that that was the place where we would die. Of course, we've heard about Cebu, uh, but never been to Cebu, uh, never been to this place. And so we were already Christians uh, when we were in Manila, and I actually served the Lord. I was serving the Lord for about two years already. I had served uh, two other pastorates. I had served in uh, Balayan, Batangas. That was my first uh, pastorate. Later on, I also pastored a church in Alabang. I also got to pastor the youth ministry as well as the young adults ministry. I was also doing uh, some uh, worship leading in our church. I had several Bible studies and I was practically everywhere. Almost every day, I had a ministry, I had a Bible study. Uh, I was coming out on TV uh, during uh, those times also. I had uh, a TV program, and I was coming out uh, in that TV program. I was uh, sharing uh, that uh, program with uh, two other people or three other people. And so uh, I was pretty established already in, in Metro Manila. Uh, things were going well. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, there was this uh, summons by my former church that I needed to go to Cebu. So obviously, I was, I was shocked. I was disturbed, uh, to say the least, I would say, because at that time, uh, my ministry was stable, but my wife was nine months pregnant. So we were about to start this new life with uh, this new baby. And now, a dramatic transition, a radical transition. We were now being asked to go to Cebu. And, and so we did, we did try because um, they were saying it was urgent. So we, um, we tried to ride the plane. And we were told my wife could not ride the plane. She was nine months pregnant. We tried to ride the boat. And we were also turned down as well. And so we were left with no choice but to have my wife give birth at that time. And um, when, she, when she gave birth after uh, just one week of, you know, looking at my baby, my firstborn, I was counting his fingers, I was counting his toes. I was just staring at him all throughout that time. And then one week's time, I had to leave. I mean, that was really terrible. I was 23 years old, my wife was 21. So I had to leave them behind. It was really a uh, tearful goodbye. And there were some people who brought me to the airport, my dad and uh, Bebo was uh, there as well, and I had to shake their hands really quick. I think my brother Jess was there. I had to shake their hands really quick, and I bid them goodbye quickly because tears were just about to fall down, and I didn't want to be very emotional in front of them, but it was really an emotion-filled situation, and I was, as I was riding that plane, it felt like I was going to fill the shoes of a giant. And I think it was the same kind of feeling that Solomon had when, when he was installed by God as a young king. He was intimidated by that prospect because he was young and he did not know, to, he did not know how to run the affairs of, of Israel, which was now a very established nation. And so that was the kind of feeling I had. And of course, uh, you know that I don't have any salary. My wife and I, we, we have been living by faith uh, for all these years. And so jumping into this situation was really uncharted territory. It was moving into a strange land, I would even say, because the moment I landed, I knew it was a different place because I could not understand the dialect. Um, the culture was something that was kind of different. 
um, I, I felt that there were some people who were kind of laid back and they were kind of not expressive with their uh, feelings. And you always had to take the initiative somehow. And so it was kind of different uh, at the beginning. Uh, finally, my wife uh, followed suit about a month or rather a few weeks after, maybe two, two weeks into my being in Cebu already. And then uh, my baby, after about a month, followed suit. And I could recall the times when uh, my wife would just uh, tear up because uh, she, was, she was saddened by the fact that, you know, she was separated from, from her baby at that time. And... Um, it was really difficult. And uh, when we, we finally got to look for a house, we just realized all we, had was, all we had was our clothes. We had no furniture. Uh, we had nothing. <laughs> all we had were, were clothes. And there were two other people who were with us, and they stayed with us. Uh, Pastor Jurem and then Brother Boogie, who was our a prayer warrior, and we did not know where the next meal would be coming from. Uh, we didn't have furniture, we didn't have refrigerator, and so what we did at that time was uh, I bought the styrofoam, and uh, we put ice on it, and we would buy uh, fresh meat from, from the market, and we'd put it there. Um, we did not have a stove, so guess what? We were cooking ancient style, chopped wood, and cooking food that way. We were washing our clothes. Um, we didn't have a dining table. <laughs> it was a good thing though that uh, the fence uh, of the house that we were renting was kind of low. And so our next door neighbor could see that, you know, we were eating, you know, with, with, uh, with no dining table. And so out of their kindness, uh, they lent to us their own table as well as some chairs. So praise God, hallelujah, we were thankful to God. There was no bed. <laughs> but unfortunately, well, fortunately for us, uh, the previous tenant actually left behind a, a torn down uh, a bed. And the coil was coming out and we made use of that. I actually woke up literally with, with a wound on, on some parts of my legs because, you know, uh, sometimes I'd, I'd touch the coil with my leg. And so I'd, I'd, be, I'd be scratched, I'd be wounded. But praise the Lord, you ha at least we were not lying on the floor. We did not have a sofa uh, set. But, uh, well, somebody left behind a... A, a, a short sofa, but with only three legs. <laughs> but anyway, uh, good thing is I was able to find um, the other leg, so I put it together, just like putting Humpty Dumpty all together again. And so we had a little sofa. Uh, my wife did not have a, uh, a mirror to you know, just look at ourselves, but we, we found a little piece of furniture that had a broken glass. So my wife made use of that. And uh, it was really difficult. There were times wherein we did not know where the next meal would come. We were actually, uh, there was a time my mom came over uh, for Christmas and we, we tried to share one piece of egg. <laughs> Could you imagine that? We, we, we shared one piece of egg, the, the three of us. And uh, there were other stories. There was one time we no longer had dinner. But thankfully, there was a sister who came over and brought one whole piece of chicken. So guess what? We had uh, a whole piece of fried chicken. So we had dinner that time. And... Uh, I particularly recall that time when my wife was sick. I did not even have a single centavo to buy her medicine. Those were really difficult times. But you know what? They are distant 
memories right now. I look back at them. I remember our simple, very humble beginnings. But right now, I rejoice in the fact that the Lord carried us through for 36 long years. And all of my children were able to finish uh, their college education. Uh, we were always on time in payment for our rent. There was never a time that we were late for paying our house rental. We were always on time. Uh, never got cut in so far as our electric bills were concerned. Never, never got cut in so far as our water bills were concerned. We were always able to pay on time. And my children uh, were educated well. Uh, they had meals always, although during the time that Maria and I uh, were alone with TJ, we had, uh, we, there were times of forced fasting. Uh, but in so far as TJ was concerned, he had, he had a supply of S26. I, I no longer can recall who was it who was continually providing S26 milk for TJ. But at least TJ never experienced going through forced fasting. Uh, again, as I mentioned to you, this is a distant memory. And we've, we've gone through the years. We've seen how God has provided. Now my children are, are married. Uh, TJ is married. He has two sons. I'm sorry, he has two children, uh, Marco and Dia. Uh, they're doing well. Uh, He's now pastoring a church. My son, AJ, uh, has uh, two children as well. He's married. Uh, he, has, uh, he has one daughter and one son. And he's the associate pastor of our church. He's helping me a lot in so many ways. Um, he's, he's doing research for me when, when, I, when I do my books. And he's helping me out in so many areas, even in technical stuff. And so I'm really proud of my, my sons. Uh, they're serving the Lord. And my daughter, Hannah, well, uh, she is also serving the Lord. She's the one who's doing the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, she's very creative. She's doing some articles. She composes songs. And uh, she now has a one-year-old boy. And they're all provided for by the Lord. And I'm really thankful. So... All I can say is that, yes, there will be uncharted territories in our lives. And right now, we're trying to navigate our way. Because right now, it's really a new normal, right? It's a new normal. I mean, who would think that we would do virtual church? Who would think that we would do online church? Uh, who would think that we would celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper in our, in our own homes? Uh, who would think that there's only one person allowed to get out of our houses so, so that that person could buy medicine or do grocery? This is now becoming the new normal. And if you ask me, I don't think this is going to pass really anytime soon. I mean, yes, we can flatten the curve, but you recall that Singapore also was able to flatten the curve. Hong Kong was able to flatten the curve. Taiwan was able to flatten the curve, but right now they're back on um, lockdown. And, and why? Well, because of travel. Because there were some people, um, some of their students from the United Kingdom, uh, some of the uh, students from Taiwan who enrolled in, in the United Kingdom, they went back home and they went back home. They were infected with COVID-19, and so it starts all over again. So how will this turn out? I'm not really sure. Do we shut down our airports for, for one year or two years? Do we shut down our borders? Do we shut down the island of Cebu and have no interaction with, with the other islands, the 7,100 islands here in the Philippines? I don't really know. All I know is that God walks with us. All I know 
is that I've walked with this God for 36 years and not once has He left me behind. Not once has He deserted me. Not once has He abandoned me. And He will not abandon me and He will never, ever abandon you as well. I'd like to share to you two spiritual anchors which you can somehow hold on to. And I'd like to share, first of all, Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, or 18 to 20, rather. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Well, the first thing I think that is very important for us to understand is that Jesus did not lose his authority here. Because some people are probably imagining, did, did Jesus just lose his authority here with the pandemic crisis? Again, he has not lost his authority. Again, friends, we have to view things not from our own human perspective, but from the perspective of God. Again, listen well, it's not about our agenda. It's all about the agenda of God. So if you and I are overly concerned about our own agenda, well, things seem to be chaotic. But you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking what is happening right now is God's agenda. So if it is all about God's agenda, then we have to remind ourselves that He has all authority with Him. He is sovereign, He is seated at the throne, and He is doing what He needs to do. In fact, when Peter was talking about trials, he said, when he spoke about trials, he said, if, nece if necessary. Meaning to say that, that trials in our lives are, are necessary to bring about the purity of our lives. We are compared, our faith is compared to gold. And gold, when it is purified, has to go through fire. And what happens is all the dirt goes to the top and the goldsmith is able to skim off all the dirt, all the impurities out of that. And, and that is what God is doing and accomplishing for us at this time, at least one of the purposes. But let me just go on. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Listen well, our job hasn't ended. In fact, we're now entering probably into very exciting times. And I say exciting in the sense that people are listening right now. And so I think it's very important that, that you understand that the work continues on. We need to continue the work of discipleship. This is the call of God. And I'll, I'll tell you when it's supposed to end because the verse also tells us when it's supposed to end. So our work continues on. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, isn't this interesting? What's particularly interesting to me is that whenever we do live stream or whenever we do our, our Sunday service online, guess where the people are coming from? Guess where the people are located when they're viewing our services? Some uh, come from from Canada, some come from the United States, some come from the United Kingdom, some from Singapore, some from the Middle East, some from Dubai, uh, some from, from Indonesia, uh, some from different parts of the Philippines. Something that without technology you cannot do, unless of course you're just like Philip, who was transported by God from one place to another. Uh, but right now, this is how we are transported into these places, into the very homes of people, and we can actually disciple them. So that's the, that's the reason why the work continues on. And, and I would like to submit to you that this is what you need to do with people who are under your care, people who are under your Bible studies, people you're counseling with. The work continues on. Don't let it stop. And here's the promise. Continuing on, it says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Maybe that will have to wait a little bit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So the teaching ministry continues on. It goes on. We must continue doing what we are doing. Our world cannot stop. Church cannot stop. We just brought it online. All right? But it has not stopped. It has never been canceled. Now, it says here, and behold, here's the promise. I am with you always. I am with you always. And what does always mean? It means always. As simple and as plain as that. Meaning to say, God is with us today. God was with us yesterday. God will be with us tomorrow. And so we are not to be discouraged. Because God is accomplishing what He wants to accomplish. And it says here, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So let me ask you the question. Is it already the end of the age? Well, not yet, obviously. So here's the question. Do we continue on? Definitely, we continue on. We continue on the work of discipleship. We continue the work of teaching. And we have the promise, God is with us. What a comforting thought that in this pandemic, God is with us. You know, it is like we are in this ark Outside is turbulence. Outside, the waters are rising and inundating the world. But Noah was insulated in this ark. And why was he insulated? Because God was going to create a new humanity through Noah and his family. God was achieving his purposes. And right now, we are in a Noah-like situation because we're on quarantine. <laughs> of course, the arcs that we are in right now might be smaller than that of uh, Noah's. But it's basically the same situation. Uh, the only difference, of course, right now is that Noah was together with the animals. Now there's a cartoon picture that, that depicts people are inside and the animals are watching from the outside. In fact, that's what's happening in India right now. The animals are reclaiming the roads right now because people are in quarantine. So the animals are going out. And maybe that's what's happening. But kidding aside, the Lord is with us. So we should not fear. Another anchor which I'd like your souls to hold on to would be Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. It says, keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. So again, what is God teaching us? He's teaching us contentment. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So the promise of God is that when it comes to provisions, okay, notice here, uh, it's talking about the context here is even talking about money. And God is saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's the reason why, again, we are not to be afraid. God will provide. And I know there are times when the supply seems to be running out, but we need to trust the Lord. God provided for Elijah when he was in the brook Cherith. God used a raven uh, of all things or of all that God has created. God used a raven. And then later on, the widow in Zarephath also provided for him. So, again, the Lord will provide. Of course, we have to tighten our belt. There is a saying in Cebuano, nga kinanglan higtan nato ang atong mga bakos. Diba? So, maybe that's what we need to do. And maybe this is a good time for you to lose weight. All right? If you're trying to lose weight, maybe this is a good time to, for you to lose weight. All right? But I think that's, that's not your problem. I think for some people, it's gaining weight that's beginning to be a problem. Now, I, I know that some of you are laughing out there because it's true, right? Anyway, it says here in verse 6, So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I'd like to end uh, by reading to you uh, today's devotion 
uh, that we sent out to you. Uh, remember, we're, we've come out with a soul care devotional. This was actually an idea that my wife uh, had in her mind. And so she, she asked Sister Karen to gather a pool of writers uh, just to write devotionals. And it's been very helpful. And today was an article that was very nice. And I'd like to read the article to you. It's a very short one. Uh, it begins with uh, the title, God Sees, God Knows. It's taken from um, the, the verse of scripture that was taken was Psalm, I'm sorry, Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. It says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. The article begins, we fear the unknown. To be placed in a territory where we have not been is a strange and frightful feeling. We want to know what happens next and see the ending of the story. Nobody likes to be left hanging. But, but, isn't, but isn't this what is happening to the world today? Even kings, rulers, presidents, government officials are anxious, anxiously working overtime as they battle an enemy they cannot see with no cure available. But God sees and God knows. He is the all-knowing God who determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Psalm 147, verse 4. And knows the number of your hairs on your head. Luke 12, verse 7. If this God who knows the infinite number of the universe down to the minutest detail of your hair, don't you think He knows the end of this pandemic? Wherever you are across the globe, quarantined in the four walls of your home, God sees and God knows. Are you grieving and in pain? He knows. Are you in need and in lack? He knows. Are you persistently praying in the privacy of your room? He knows. Are you faithfully serving Him in the background? He knows. Are you silently winning souls for Christ? He knows. Whatever it is you are going through right now, God sees and God knows because He is the omniscient God. Nothing is hidden in His sight. In this season of uncertainty, trust His mind. In your waiting, trust His heart. In your seeking, trust His wisdom. In this pandemic, trust His hand. He is God and there is no other. I hope the sharing today has been a blessing to you. And so I'm ready to answer some questions. So uh, I'll give you a little time to compose your, your questions. There are some questions actually that have been sent already to me. I will answer them. And if we still have time, I will be answering all the other questions. But for now, uh, let me just take a little water break. And uh, just to compose myself once again. Let's head off to some questions. All right, here's one question. What is the doctrine of election? Does God elect people to salvation? Why? All right. So again, the question is, what is the doctrine of election? Does God elect people to salvation? And why? Well, again, I, I, want, I don't want to answer based on my opinion. I want the scriptures to answer this for you. So let me turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 1 at this time. And this is what it says, beginning 
at verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as, listen well, just as He chose us, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. So to the question, does God elect people? The answer is obviously yes, based on Ephesians chapter 1. And for what reason is this? Well, verse 6 gives us the reason, to the praise of the glory of His grace. So once again, from the standpoint of God, why did He do this? This is for His glory. Now, some of you might ask, but why is it that God elects people? Well, He elects people because the truth of the matter is we are incapable of choosing God. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said to His disciples? You did not choose me, but I chose you. And why is it that we are incapable of trusting in God by ourselves? Well, Romans chapter 3, and once again, I'd like to bring you to that passage. And this speaks about the total depravity of man. Beginning in verse 10, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. Now notice, this is what it says. There is none who seeks for God. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. So to, the ans to answer the question, why does God elect people? It is because of the total depravity of man. We are incapable of seeking God ourselves. Having said that, God's sovereignty and human responsibility are meshed together. Now, how this plays out in the mind of God and in the working of God is something that is not very plain to us because of the finite mind that we have. But the Bible is very clear. There is an aspect of human responsibility because John chapter 1, 12 says, To them that received Him gave He the right to become children of God. So there is that part of human responsibility. You have to receive Him. And then in Romans chapter 10, it says that you have to call upon Him. He who calls upon the Lord shall be saved, the Bible says. Now, I do not pretend to actually understand how that works. All I understand is this. If we talk about salvation, it is all by God. It is all by grace. It is all by faith. But you have to believe. You have to repent. You have to receive Jesus Christ into your life. You have to surrender your life to Jesus. Make Him the Lord and Savior of your life. And let me just take this time to appeal once again to those of you who do not have a relationship with Christ. Maybe you grew up thinking that you were a Christian. But you know, a true Christian will always bear fruit. And that fruit is the fruit of holiness. That is the evidence of true sonship. If there is no holiness in your life, if there is no walking in the light, walking in the truth of God's Word and practicing that truth, then you are not a Christian. And how do you become a Christian? It is not by good works. It is by grace alone, through faith alone. And by the way, that's the next question that I would like to answer because the next question is, how do you deal with fellow Christians who are hard, or who probably the, the way this should be stated is that, how do you deal with fellow Christians who believe that salvation is faith plus works and not absolutely all by grace? Well, 
my, my answer to that is show them scripture. And if you show them scripture, it is very, very clear that salvation is completely by grace alone. Works have no part in it. Why? Because the standard of God is perfection. James said, if you stumbled just at one point of the law, you have broken the whole commandment. So in other words, just one sin is enough to bring you to hell. And just to give you a picture of how this plays out, the Bible says, thou shalt not bear false witness. In very plain and simple terms, that means don't lie. That is why in the book of Revelation, it says that liars will go to hell. So it's not a joke when, when some people say liars go to hell. The Bible, in fact, says that liars do go to hell. So even if you just lied, even just once, that's enough to bring you to hell. So how can it be by good works? Cannot be. It's impossible. Jesus Christ himself said it is humanly impossible. And so let me just bring you to some texts in the scriptures. First of all, maybe I'd, I'd like to bring you to the book of Romans. Hold on. Can you open your Bible, uh, Bibles to the book of Romans at this time? Romans chapter 3. And let me just read verses 19 and 20. It says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be, become accountable to God. Now, listen well to verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Now, you can't argue with God. God already says this. It says, by the law, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for through the law comes the knowledge of sin the purpose of the law was to show you that you are a sinner that's the purpose of the law the law was something that you and i could not comply to perfectly we could not obey it completely so what was the purpose of the law the law intended to show you that you are a sinner and that you need a savior so let me go to Galatians. Uh, Galatians 2, uh, verse 21. It says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. If righteousness comes through the law, Christ died needlessly. So again, uh, think about this. If you and I could actually obey, by the way, the commandments of God are not just the Ten Commandments. You're talking about, if you go to the Old Testament, you're talking about 600 plus commandments. So it's not just the Ten Commandments. And, and the Bible is very clear here. We could not save ourselves because of good works. And so that's the reason why Christ had to come. That's the reason why He had to die. And again, the book of Galatians says, if righteousness comes through the law or through good works, then Christ died needlessly. If we could actually obey the law, there's no need for Christ to come. So again, it really is out of logic when you say that I need Christ and I need to do my part. No, you could not do your part. That's why Jesus Christ had to come and die and pay for your sins. Now, let me go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, which is the basic or the standard text that we normally use to prove that salvation is by grace. It says, For by grace you have been saved, past tense, through faith. And that is why it is possible to know that you're saved here and now, because notice, Paul was not writing to dead people. He was writing to people who were alive at that time. You won't write to people who are dead, right? So he was writing to people who were alive. And he says, for by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. And, that's, there's the conjunction, 
and that not of yourselves. And by the way, since it is this conjunction connects this to faith, it tells you that faith is actually a gift of God. And that's confirmed actually with the next phrase. It says, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So notice here, faith is a gift of God. And this is where we, we uh, tell people that the calling of God, here is where, where you find the effectual calling of God, wherein you experience the irresistible grace of God so that you come to Him because He gives you the gift of faith and the gift of repentance, something that we should all be thankful for. And for those of you who are listening for the first time, maybe you feel that tug in your heart right now. Well, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. The Bible says uh, in the Gospel of John that the Holy Spirit comes into the world to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. If I were you, the Bible says today is the day of salvation, I would accept Christ here and now and have the assurance of salvation. Salvation is not by good works. It is by grace alone. I'd like to to answer that question also with a final verse of Scripture. I just had to go through a lot of verses. Titus chapter 3, uh, verse 5. It says, verse 5, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. Again, not because of the deeds we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. There you go. Again, it's, it's mercy. Again, it's grace. And it says, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit brought you into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So that answers the, uh, the second question. Third, is Job a fictional character? I don't think so. Um, if you turn to Job chapter 1, verse 1, it says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Now, very important. When the Bible speaks in parables, normally, or when it, it speaks metaphorically or figuratively, it does not give names. For example, if you go to the Gospels, you don't, when you go to the parables, there are no names that are, are given in the parables because it's, it's an illustration. But whenever the Lord uses a proper name, then you know that Jesus is actually talking about a historical person. So, for example, the Lord Jesus Christ talked about Jonah. Jonah is a historical person. Now, when the Bible most especially uh, talks about not only the name of a person, but the place where he came from, it is a sign that this is talking about a historical person. So let me just read through this. Um, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. 